In previous episodes of Engineering the Jigsaw, we've talked about diagnostics, and in particular, in our most recent episode, Onboard Diagnostics, or OBD, and that, of course, we talked about in the context of diagnostics of emissions control systems. Is OBD all there is to talk about, though? Well, no. So let's go explore. Hi everybody, I'm in Cunningham from Vector GB. Welcome to this foundation level episode of Engineering the Jigsaw, foundation episode number 19. What is UDS or Unified Diagnostic Services? Last time we talked about OBD2 and how this was released in 1990 and had a deadline of introduction of 1994. Now this was an American regulation and standardization effort. So what happened in Europe? Well, in 1994, an ISO standard, International Organization for Standardization, ISO, ISO standard 9141 was published for something called an ISO K line, which is a set of requirements for interchange of digital information in scope of diagnostic systems for road vehicles. So this is the start of standardization for, by ISO for retrieving diagnostic data from vehicles. And in 1998, regulations were published by the, within Europe requiring European onboard diagnostics by 2001 for petrol vehicles and 2004 for diesel vehicles. And additional standardization happened in other markets. So for example, there's something called Japanese OBD, there's, uh, or JOBD for short, there's ADR 79 slash 01, which is the Australian OBD regulations. There are uh, many OBD regulations. And it's important to note that European OBD and the other OBD regulations that exist around the world are all different in some way. So it's really important if you're working on OBD to be able to configure your OBD software to suit the market, particular market, a particular vehicle is going into. A, a bit of an aside there, but it's important for you to, to know. So we'll stress it again in this episode. Now, beyond European OBD, in 1999, something called KWP or Keyword Protocol 2000, KWP 2000, was published by ISO. So ISO 14230. This really grew out of the standardization around European OBD and, and the work to, to develop a, a set of diagnostic standards in, in Europe for retrieving diagnostic information from the emissions control system. But KWP was not only for the emissions control system, it was to retrieve diagnostic information from any part of the vehicle. Now, unfortunately, after publication, many let's call them dialects of KWP came into being. And of course, this isn't really the intention of a standard. The intention of a standard is that everything should be standard, not different. So moving on a little bit, let's see what happened next in the early 2000s. Well, firstly, in 2002, the initial specification of the local interconnect network was published in 2002. And in 2006, there was a, another industry initiative. These were both consortia, um, groups of companies that developed these specifications. And FlexRay was published in 2006. In 2004, though, there was a really important ISO specification published. This was for do CAN or diagnostics over CAN. And the ISO standard for this is ISO 15765. And there are a number of parts of this standard for diagnostic communication over CAN. Let's go and take a little bit of a look at those parts. So the first part of the standard, part one, is general information. So it's structure of the standard, other related standards, a bit of vocabulary, all those kind of things. In part two, we have a description of network layer services, a transport protocol. So how we can send and receive data that is larger 
than fits into a single CAN frame. So if you remember our OC layer stack, remember we have our high level application protocol, we have our physical layer and a data link layer, and in between, roughly, you'll, you'll find a transport protocol possibility. So this is the transport protocol for diagnostic purposes. And it's also used for other purposes nowadays too, but originally specified in the context of diagnostics. Part four, we actually mentioned in episode F18, is the requirements for emissions related systems, which standardized things like the CAN identifiers that are to be used for OBD purposes. Most interesting though, part three, the implementation of unified diagnostic services on CAN. So the word unified here is important. We had all these dialects that grew out of KWP. ISO decided to try to unify all of the things that people were trying to do with KWP into a new standard. And this was called Unified Diagnostic Services. Actually, and strangely, although ISO 15765 Part 3 was published in 2004, ISO 14229 Part 1 for Unified Diagnostic Services was published first in 2006. And Unified Diagnostic Services is frequently shortened to UDS. So this is really interesting now. This is what we're here to talk about, UDS. So we have our first publication in 2006. But then there was a further publication in 2013, edition two. And what actually happened in edition two is some parts of ISO 15765 were replaced by parts of ISO 14229. In particular, part three of ISO 15765 was effectively made obsolete because the implementation of CAN was then specified as part of ISO 14229 itself. And in 2020, there was a third edition published, which again, changed aspects of the protocol. So it's really important for you to know if you're working with UDS, which version of the standard, which edition of the standard you're working with, because there are really very important differences between them. So make sure to watch out for that if it's relevant for you. What does the third edition actually cover? Well, firstly, the ability to control the, the, the basic aspects of diagnostics and communication, diagnostic communication. So the management of those functions. So how uh, we might want to maybe authenticate with an ECU, how we might want to do some security stuff to, to validate that we're allowed to interact with an ECU. Also, there's a concept of sessions where we can unlock additional capability by telling the ECU to go to an extended capability mode, or if we want to program it to go to a programming mode. So this is all part of the diagnostic communication management section. We have the ability to read and write data from inside the ECU. So this is not reprogramming. This is more like adjusting or reading settings or maybe reading internal voltages or other information that's inside the ECU. And of course, on the subject of other information inside the ECU, the ability to read the fault memory. So if our ECU detects a fault, it can log that effectively in its memory and store that information for us to retrieve later. The ability to interact with inputs and outputs of an ECU. So to read what a present input is telling an ECU or to actually tell an ECU to pretend an, ECU, uh, an input is at a particular level and also to activate outputs to help us during diagnosis. Now, this is a, a way to interact with the hardware of the ECU, the electronics directly. Sometimes though, for diagnostics, we want to do some software related things. So we have the ability with UDS to activate special software inside the ECU that's included for diagnostic purposes. So maybe the special test routine that we want to run or a special initialization routine where an ECU needs to move something to learn where the, the limits of, of motion are. So this is routine control and the ability to stop, start routines and also request results from routines is included in the protocol. And then of course, we talked about software update in the past, the ability to upload and download 
information software or files to and from an ECU is, is covered in UDS as well. Now, let's just think about some real key differences between OBD2 and UDS. So in OBD2, we talked about how SAE J1979 specifies modes and optional data. Our first major difference between UDS and OBD2 is kind of in the name. In UDS, we have a concept of a service or and a service ID for short rather than a mode and then optional data associated with that service. And as it happens, there are about 27 different services specified in um, edition three of, of UDS compared with only 10 modes in the OBD standards. So there's many, many more services that we can make use of in, uh, in UDS. Also, within UDS, we have an idea of a sub-function for some services. So a sub-function is, is uh, it's a slightly strange kind of set of words. What does it mean? Well, if we think about, for example, interacting with the fault memory, there's many ways we might want to interact with the fault memory. So we have a, a high-level fault memory service that tells an ECU when it receives a request. This relates to the fault memory. But do we want to know the total number of faults that an ECU has recorded? Do we want to know the number of faults that are in a particular state? Or do we want to get information related to the faults? Do we want to retrieve actual fault data? These are all achievable via sub-functions of the high-level fault memory service. We'll come back to the fault memory in just a second, but let's also talk about IDs. So in SAEJ1979, we talked about MIDs, PIDs, and TIDs, and so on. Now, these IDs in J1979 are specified as single bytes. This means we can only have 255 of each. In UDS, we have two bytes for each ID. That means we can specify up to 65,535 IDs potentially. Now, the UDS standard actually cuts this down a bit. It, it, it assigns some ranges that we're allowed to use for IDs. But within those ranges, vehicle manufacturers can mostly decide for themselves what each UDS ID relates to and how the data is structured. So where we have everything specified in J1979, you can buy the standard and then you can send a request to any vehicle that supports OBD and understand a response. Unless you have the specific data that describes the IDs for a particular ECU and a particular vehicle, you, will, you can't achieve the same thing using UDS. So this is very different. Also, with DTCs, in the case of J1979, because it only relates to the admission system, it was standardized on the basis of using two bytes for DTCs. With UDS, we again have an additional byte for DTCs. So we have three byte numbers for DTCs. So it's like 255 times uh, 65,500. 35 DTCs. It's a lot of potential DTCs that we can refer to in UDS. And these can be differently defined for every ECU. So we can get a huge, huge number of DTCs potentially from a, a vehicle. So, and again, the vehicle manufacturer really gets to choose what each UDS DTC relates to in general. So this is a big difference between OBD and, and UDS. With UDS, there's a lot of freedom for the vehicle manufacturer. As a summary, after the development of European onboard diagnostics in 1998, the KWP2000 standard was released in 1999. Unfortunately, many dialects of keyword protocol resulted. So in 2004, Diagnostics on CAN was standardized based on unified diagnostic services. And this actual standard, UDS, was published first in 2006. UDS IDs and DTCs are each one byte larger than OBD2 IDs and DTCs. So in UDS, we can refer to a lot more things than we have the ability to refer to using 
J1979. And UDS describes many services, and each of these services is able to have subfunctions which are defined in the standard. It's really important for you to remember there are three different UDS editions. It's really important because they really are different in, in some of the behavior of, of the ECUs, what they can return to you, and also the functions that they provide. So if you want to authenticate with an ECU, that's only possible from the third edition using public key certificates. If you want to know more about diagnostics, make sure to visit our website for our support in products, training, services, and so on. And in particular, look out for the Vector Academy website where you can find formal training on diagnostics, including UDS and OBD2. Make sure to join us for our next episode where we're going to find out how your OBD and UDS are now starting to converge and remove some of those differences that I've just talked about. Make sure to join me after the music if you want to find out how to contact us. I'm in Cunningham for Vets GB. Really hope you've enjoyed this episode of Engineering the Jigsaw. Make sure you, if you have, you give it a thumbs up in YouTube. If you have questions or ideas, then give us a comment down below the video. If you don't want to do it in public, if you want to keep it private, then drop us an email to our special email address engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. You can find a link to a web page with those contact details on in the description for this video. Make sure that you subscribe to get notified as we release new episodes and as Vector publishes its excellent and informative videos on its YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our playlists. We have our foundation episodes playlist and also intermediate level playlist as well for you to binge and catch up with. We'll catch you for another episode soon. Goodbye.